Uh, as I said just a minute ago, we have Ryan Reese with us this morning. He'll be coming up in just a minute. He's one of the founders of the Whosoevers. Uh, he's got a neat ministry. So we've been here in California and the... Easy. Easy. <laughs> so we've been here... Hold on, not yet. <laughs> we have a video for you in a second. Uh, <laughs> anyway, he speaks at all kinds of different venues, uh, including public schools, colleges, universities, uh, juvenile detention centers, rehab centers, skate parks, uh, and at churches, and of course his home church at Calvary Chapel, Golden Springs. He has a heart for reaching the lost. Uh, he shares his testimony in his book, uh, Kill the Noise, and he was saved out of, uh, out of some deep darkness. Right? And, and I think uh, all of us, at, at least some, we can relate with that. I hope you can relate with that this morning, and that God has saved each of us out of sins. But he shares about the lifestyle that God brought him out of, of drugs and partying and uh, rock and roll and different things. And uh, he grew up in the church, Ryan. He grew up, his dad is a great pastor, uh, Rolf Reese. And he grew up knowing about the truth. But in his book, he shares how he came to know the truth or know the one who is true. And that's uh, one of the key things I hope you guys grab out of his message this morning. Is it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. Amen? Uh, so thank you, Lord, that we have a God who wants a personal relationship uh, with each of us and wants us to walk with him daily. So with that being said, we have a uh, short video to play, and then Ryan will come on up. So we've been here in California, and the pandemic shut everything down. Around the world, people are afraid and on edge. I thought it'd be a good opportunity for the whosoever's to be active and doing ministry in this time right now. Since everything's shut down, Idaho's open, so that means we can give the gospel out and reach as many people as possible. We came up with 10,000 flyers, 100 posters, and I just charged it to Idaho. Whosoever's trip is completely insane. Life-changing. Guns, God, fireworks, <laughs> the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going down. Skateboarding. I missed it. He came up to me and he's like, dude, what happened tonight was crazy. I've been to youth group, I've been to church, but I've never experienced what happened tonight. And I said, shut your mouth, dude, okay? And I said, wait till the camera gets here. <laughs> Yeah, now I went from tour mode to daddy duty, so this is gonna be interesting. <laughs> You're like, why am I here? Why am I going through this? Why is this happening? Sometimes there's not answers to that. During this time of coronavirus, when everything's been put on pause, a lot of people were left to look in the mirror of asking themselves, who am I? Who am I without school, sports, you know, social media, friends, and all of these hobbies? God cares about the smallest details because he has a plan and he has a purpose for everyone's life. That's the message we share with the youth of the nation and of the world. He loves you and he has a plan for every detail of your life. And if you're willing to step out by faith, well, you're going to watch God do the impossible. Keep coming. This is awesome. This is awesome. This is why I came. We're saying there's best trick contest happening. The city doesn't know. No one knows. We don't even know if we're going to get shut down. But as far as I'm concerned, came up with the idea. God confirmed. So I just left and we went to Idaho. Same place. Yes. Whoa. All right. Yeah. So that happened. Um, but that kind of happened again when we been when we came here to uh, to Texas. We this is uh, stop eight. So we got invited first by your church, your pastor. So thank you for inviting us out. And um, we're like, well, let's see if anyone else wants us to come out. So we opened the door. We let people know through social media we were going to come. And we ended up touring from Austin to Houston. We, we, well, we started off in San Antonio, which was awesome. Then from there, we went, well, I think we started in Austin, then San Antonio that night. And then we went to a, uh, a, a, a camp with um, women, troubled girls under 18. And we spent time there for about two days, hanging out with them on their farm. 
um, sharing with, with some girls that didn't want anything to do with God. Some of them are open. I shared a message with them, and then I said, have you guys ever been baptized? They're like, no. I'm like, well, do you guys have water around here? I said, we got a dirty pond over there. I'm like, is there alligators? Uh, so they said, um, so is there anything that will kill us in there? No, so I don't trust Texas, all right? Um, so, but anyway, uh, so they had a pond, and we ended up uh, baptizing uh, seven of the girls, and it was, it was crazy. It was crazy. Uh, it was very powerful, because you know their stories, and just to see them, and they're crying, and God, the Holy Spirit is there, and the presence of God, and just such an amazing cool, raw, Jesus, messy ministry stuff, just out, going from town to town, village to village, and uh, then we went to a youth camp, or not a youth camp, a youth conference at Calvary Chapel, uh, Houston, with Ron Hint, and that, that was a whole nother thing, and, you know, the, 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 the students dealing with depression, suicide, anxiety, um, and, and, you know, uh, hearing voices. We were praying for kids, hearing voices. And, you know, during the altar call, you know, a bunch of people came forward. And then all of a sudden I heard the Holy Spirit say, um, cutting. And I said, hey, there's people here cutting. And all of a sudden, like, another, like, ten girls came up. Um, um, it was, it was, oh, no, anorexia, uh, or uh, eating disorders. That's what it was. The word was eating disorders. And all of a sudden another eight girls came up. And it was just a very crazy time. Then we ended up. Uh, it, with Teen Challenge, under 18 and over 18, and that was a whole nother, <laughs> one kid was on drugs there, I prayed for him, he was hearing voices, and then a lot of them were dealing with demonic stuff, a lot of uh, demon uh, stuff in their rooms, being choked out and the whole thing, so I was talking to someone earlier, where's he at, right here with the long hair, um, he came from our church in Diamond Bar, um, but, you know, we were talking about how you know, how the, the enemy has a grip on, on people, and people watch 9 to 10 hours a day, or 11 hours a day of social media. Jesus says that light is, is the, the eye is the light to the body. Do you imagine how much darkness of the images and music that you're listening to, and the stuff you're putting in, it's like, the Bible says, resist, resist the devil and he will flee. Uh, people are just opening the gates and windows and doors and everything just to let the enemy in. They're already struggling with stuff in life, and the enemy is getting a grip on this culture. This is why there has to be a great awakening, a great revival, and we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need, we need it to be so powerful in this great revival that I believe is coming soon. Um, that it will be greater than what happened during the Jesus movement or any other revival ever because there has the power of the Holy Spirit has to break through and literally encounter people in a supernatural way to break through all that stuff. That is the only way that anything can happen in this world because the state of the world and where we're at, I'm not talking about doom and gloom, I'm just saying that we are living in a very different time these days and the amount of darkness that you put in that you don't even realize what's going in in your mind. You're being inundated with this stuff. Why is there so much depression? Why is there so much suicide? Why is there so much anxiety? Why is, why is there so much drug, drug uh, uh, abuse? Back when I was young, we had to go out and learn how to do drugs. Now I just get on my phone. I can figure out every way to dr use drugs possible, all the new drugs and where to get it and, you know, the whole thing. It's like we're in a whole different time that we're living in. But that's not my message. I was just sharing that with you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so during the pandemic, I got bored because I'm an evangelist. I speak all over the world, and I got shut down. So we, we went to Idaho, fell in love with Idaho, thought it was epic. Um, I also wrote a book called Kill the Noise, Finding Meaning Above the Madness. Um, someone, someone, I was at a conference speaking. Some guy pulled me out of the crowd. He goes, you don't know me. And he prophesied over me that I was going to write a book. About three weeks later, I got a book deal, um, and this book is a it's a it's a faith builder. It's a it's a it's a faith builder. It's a discipleship tool, and I get saved in the first chapter. But I walk you through the process of what the what what sin is, what the Holy Spirit is, the job of the Holy Spirit, the call that God has has on you. When you give your life to God, you end up in an identity crisis between the world and, and the church, and you don't know how to act, what to listen to, or what to do. You're just kind of like a fish out of water. So I, I walk people through the process. So no, no matter where you're at, if you're in a dry season or you just need to get encouraged, wherever you're at, 
This book is full of faith stories. It's almost like I was inspired by Chuck Smith's book, Living Water, because I'm a Bible teacher, so I like to put Bible stories with life application, real life stories, all the way through the whole thing. When people are posting pictures of the book online and tagging me, they're right, the date, they're underlined. It's like a study Bible, basically, because this is what I created, because I can only be in front of people so long, and then I have to go to the next stop. I'm like Jesus and the disciples, from town to town, city to city. So I want to leave people with something that they can build their faith. And I asked God, I said, God, give me like three star reviews, just so I'm above average. God has given me five-star reviews on Apple, Amazon, and all the other platforms. This book is sold at Walmart, Target, uh, Barnes & Nobles, everywhere. Books are sold. It's with a major uh, 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 publishing company, so it's everywhere. And I have it here. I'll sign them for you. If you've got prodigal sons and daughters and whoever, wherever, everyone, you know, I have people coming up, and they're like, I need five. My ex-wife, I got my kid, I got this and this and this. You know, my friend, my, you know, so it's here. It's, this is not my testimony, like, you know, a bunch of cool stories or bad stories or whatever. This is a book that will transform your life and make you sold out for Christ and help you. I walk, I answer the questions that people have that, that no one answers really of like, and I'm very transparent about what I went through and how I had to navigate through this whole Christian Christian thing and still be working in the mainstream. I still work in the mainstream uh, music industry, still work in the, in, the, in the professional skate world. So I'm still going on tour. I'm still in the culture 100%. But then my, most of my ministry is it's 90% in the streets, and then I get the surface in the church. So that's my whole mission. It's the Great Commission. And that's what we are all actually called to. Jesus said before leaving planet Earth, he said, go and make the disciples of the nation, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey my commandments. That's why we're here. We're learning how to obey the commandments, and then we're supposed to go. Jesus said, preach the gospel, signs and wonders follow. So don't, don't be mistaken. If you're full of the Holy Spirit and the man and woman of the word of God, don't think you're going to lay hands. You will lay hands on the sick. They will recover. You'll get words of knowledge, words of prophecy. You'll be operating in the power of the Holy Spirit and live in the great Commission. Why? Because Jesus said so. I'm a man of the Bible. I'm a man of the word. I just read it and believe it, okay? That's my downfall. But that's what we believe in Calvary Chapel. Read it for face value. It is what it is, and Jesus never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he did this stuff in the scriptures, he's going to do it now. Before, one last thing, on the Bible app, if you download the Bible app on your smartphones, you type in my name or the whosoever's, I have a, a seven-day devotion called Kill the Noise. Every month, I'm releasing a new seven-day devotion going through the Gospel of John. So also got bored in the pandemic and started doing that. So I'm just glad that things are starting to get open again so I don't have to sit home anymore. All right, here we go. Tired of writing stuff. All right, here we go. So we're going to uh, talk about um, John the Baptist this morning. I like John the Baptist. The message is called Kill the Noise. This is a man that killed the noise. He was sold out for Christ, and God used him in a very powerful way. John the Baptist's message, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 3, but I'm going to give you a little intro. John the Baptist's story is in all four Gospels, so God wanted us to know the story and know it well. God has been silent for 400 years since the last book of Malachi. And, now, and he hasn't spoke to his people. Remember, the Holy Spirit would come upon people, and the prophets would speak to the nation. God stopped talking to his people for 400 years. That must have stunk. I'll use that word in church. Stunk. Stinky? That would have been lame. Okay? That would have been lame. Not hearing from God for 400 years. And the religious system was broken. John is Jesus' cousin, and he was the greatest prophet of the Old Covenant. He was the forerunner for the King Jesus, the Messiah. He was full of the Holy Spirit from birth. Imagine being full of the Holy Spirit from birth. Do you know how many mistakes we would have not have made? He was filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. The Holy Spirit is the one that gives us those promptings, those stop signs in our life. Don't do this. Don't do that, right? And the power of the Holy Spirit is the dunamis power. So he helps us to overcome our sin nature. Some of you guys, like me, used to love to run stop signs of the Holy Spirit. And you're still running stop signs of the Holy Spirit. Stop at the stop signs. 
So John the Baptist, he had the Holy Ghost in him from birth. He was one of the greatest prophets of the Old Covenant. He didn't fit into the mold of the church or become institutionalized by church or church traditions. Back in the old days, electric guitars and drums were actually from the devil in the church. Did you know that? That was a tradition. He wasn't institutionalized by church or traditions. He was a PK. He was in line to become a priest in the temple in Jerusalem. Or in other words, he was, an, he was a pastor's kid in line to become a pastor in the church, if you will. At the mega church of mega churches, the temple. That's a big deal, right? He would have been famous. He wasn't down with that form of religion, so he went to the desert. He, uh, he left the city to kill the noise and wait on God to hear his voice. When in my book, I have a chapter called God's Signs in the Storms. When I'm trying to make a big decision in my life, like getting married or career change or have kids or, you know, all these big decisions. I, I go into a fasting, I go into a praying, and I go to kill the noise. I go to the desert Joshua tree, and I sit out there, and I wait till I hear God's voice. And every time I go out there, he gives me that download as I'm connected to the power from heaven. The most hi-fi, it's like the, high, it's like the Wi-Fi, but it's like the most hi-fi because God's the most high. And I'm connected, and God shoots that download, and he speaks to me. God signs in the storms when I'm in those critical places in my life, but he gives me signs. John the Baptist is out in the desert, killing, eating, uh-oh, out of power. <laughs> it sounds like it's going out. Anyway, so he's out there in the desert waiting on God. He had a relationship with God through the reading of the word of the scriptures of the Old Testament. He was fasting ferociously and praying hard, and he was a Nazarite. That's what, that means he never cut his hair. This is why I'm like this. No. Um, the Nazarites wouldn't cut their hair. Uh, they wouldn't touch nothing from the vine. Uh, no wine, no grapes, no raisins. Why? Because the Nazarites had a, a very radical call, a sold-out call for Christ. I would rather live, I live myself, my life as a, Naz, not a Nazarite, but I don't touch anything from the vine. Why? Because I believe that when you mess with the vine, the alcohol, it, it, it clouds the connection. It's like Wi-Fi. It's like on my phone, if I'm trying to get a download from my wife, like a photo or something, if I'm in a brick building, the, the, the connection to the Wi-Fi gets broken. I don't get that full download. I don't get that text message on time. It's delayed. And in the same way, when you start clouding that connection to the most hi-fi, you can't piggyback off the power and you can't get the downloads. You can't get the words. You can't get the promptings of the Holy Spirit. You can't get the stop signs in our life, and that's what happens with the clogging. The scripture says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be not intoxicated with wine, but be intoxicated with the Holy Spirit. Be not under the influence of wine, but be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. I want to be used at 100%, and the other thing that clogs the power or breaks the signal, Jesus says in John 7, 37, Anyone that's thirsty may come to me. Anyone that believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, I will give you the living water. So if we are connected, if you will, to the hose from heaven, the torrents of living water, like Niagara Falls, the power from heaven, the only thing that clogs that dam is sin. Sin in our life will clog that dam so you can't get that full connection to the power. But John the Baptist was a man after the scriptures fasting and praying and connected to the power from heaven, killing the noise. He lived off the land. He was unorthodox. He was radical in his approach in ministry. His message was straight to the point. Repent, be baptized, turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. He was on bold and on fire for God. Jesus said in John 5, 35, John was like a burning and shining lamp. John was killing the noise in the desert, not distracted by the cares of the world or the shiny objects that Satan likes to hook us up with or get us off course. Because the scripture says he's come to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come to give life abundantly. So John the Baptist is in the desert, not caught up in the shiny objects, not distracted, fasting, praying hard, being in tune to God to see what God wanted to do in his life. John waited on God for his game plan, his direction, and his perfect timing for this uncommon revival with the common people. He was full of the Holy Spirit. He was in tune to the Holy Spirit. He was listening for God's voice and seeking his will. Then it says in Luke verse 2 to Luke verse chapter 3 verse 2 to 3 it says, 
at this time, at what time? When he was in the desert killing the noise. At this time, a message from God came to John. He's connected to the power. He gets the download. Came to John, son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. When it says wilderness, think about desert and nothing out there, okay? Nothing but rocks and dirt. Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized to show they've repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. The first words out of John's mouth was repent. First message out of Jesus' mouth was, was repent. First message out of Peter's mouth, repent. First message out of Paul's mouth, repent. John's ministry was short-lived, but a powerful work of the Holy Spirit. Now picking up in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, it says, In those days John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and he began preaching. In what days? When he was 30 years old, he was fasting ferociously, waiting on God, picked up the signal, got the download, and went to the Judean wilderness and began preaching the, preaching the message of God's coming. He was a, oh, by the way, out there where he was at, I went there to Israel probably right before everything got shut down. Um, they just opened up the area where John the Baptist would have uh, been preaching. When you see pictures of Israel, people get baptized in a white robe and like green water. That's not where John the Baptist was. He was actually out in the wilderness, in the desert, and they just opened it up. It used to be full of minefields. They actually just kind of cleaned up the area where he would have been. And what it was is our tour guide says it's a major highway. Where he was at, it was a major highway between Europe, Asia, and Africa. And he was right in the middle along the water. If you're in the desert, nothing around, you want to be by the water, right? If you're a human or an animal, you want water. So he was right by the water, and he was going on both sides of the Jordan River preaching the good news that people needed to baptize because it was a major highway for trade for people to go up and down. So if you were in Los Angeles, for you California people, he would have been right in downtown where the 60, the 10, the 101, the, one, uh, the 101, the 110, the 2, and the 5, but they all meet. Major highway, okay? His message was repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent. What's up with that word? That word used to drive me crazy, probably because I needed to repent. I think of people in the front of like concerts or like raves or even at like, I seen them at the front of Billy or Greg Laurie's Harvest Crusade. They're out there. Repent. You're going to go to hell. God hates you. You stink. Hate, hate. Ah. That's them. And I'll walk up. I'll be like, so, hey, how's it going, man? You reaching some people out here? No. How many people got saved? No one. Well, it doesn't sound like you're doing it again. What are you doing here? I'm like, I'm going to the concert. You're not a Christian. You're going to hell. I'm like, well, let me know how this whole thing goes, okay? Um, that's not what God's heart is. So what is repent? Repent is when you confess your sins. When I was in that hotel room, I used to manage a professional skateboard team. I found myself um, living the dream, caught up in all the shiny objects. <laughs> if you could just see me just like totally wrapped up in a coffin and fishing string, <laughs> that was me. <laughs> spiritual just strongholds and addictions and just jacked up after nine days of cocaine xanax and alcohol i talk about this in my chapter two called crossroads i repent of my sins i said god i'm a sinner I, I got a drug problem i got an alcohol problem i got a porn problem i got anger problem i got bitterness i mean i got it all lord <laughs> i got major issues and i repented of my sins at that time i decided repent means to kill the noise i said god I'm not going to go after the shiny objects anymore. I'm killing the noise. I'm not going to be distracted, and I'm going to go to you. Repent means to change your heart and the mind in the direction to which you are going. If the Bible says the wages of sin lead to death, that means if I'm driving and I'm going to drive off this cliff and I know I'm going to die spiritually and physically, then I need to basically, what do I need to do? I need to, like, turn around, right? Or what do I do? I flip a U-turn. Flip a U-E. So what is repent? Flip a U-E. You go, instead of going that direction, you go to God. So what is repent? Flip a Yui. Very simple. Okay? So here's the message was, repent of your sins, turn to God. Uh, is it, what is his message? His message was, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Flip a Yui. The prophet, said, prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, he's the voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the roads for him, or in the other gospel says, Make the crooked path straight. Now, the kings back in those days when they wanted to get to, say, Dallas from here, um, you know, 
they're they're like they're like rappers. They like roll with their entourage. Have you ever seen a rappers roll up to a concert? I've booked Wu Tang, a Fifty Cent. I've booked a lot of people for the music festivals I used to do. These guys roll in with their aunts, uncles, babies, mamas, cousins, security, their drug dealer, the alcohol dude. It's like a whole thing. It's a shenanigans, right? So when the king would go to, say if they're going to go to Dallas, and there's like a mountain there, or if there's a crooked path or there's potholes, what do the kings do? Because they're ballers. They're like, if there's a mountain, level it. Little road, open it up. I got my security. I got my girl, my, my wife, my cooks. Every, the loot that for the transaction, I'm going to be exchanging the gold or money with the next kingdom. Make the crooked path straight. If there's a puddle, fill it in. I'm not trying to get a flat tire. I don't want to get robbed. We got to have a straight shot there. You know, we need to make the, the, the massive diamond lane to get there with no um, problems. So what happens is in the same way, John the Baptist, his message, his life was a straight path of Jesus. When you looked at him, and I'm going to just paraphrase, when the, the stuff he was looking to, on his smartphone, the stuff he was watching at night, the Netflix series, the, the, the music he was listening to, you know, the people he was hanging out with, and, and not, not that Jesus hung out with sinners. Don't, 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 don't get it twisted. He hung out, and the religious leaders were not too happy about that. But he, he, he had a mission. His mission was the Great Commission. But where he was seen and what he was doing, and he was, he was led by the Spirit because he had the Spirit of God inside of him, that he was a straight path to Jesus. He wasn't making the crooked path straight. My question to you is, are you making the straight path crooked to Jesus or the or the Crooked path straight. Wait, I get confused. Straight path crooked or straight crooked path straight? Are you putting potholes in front of people? Are you tripping people up with your life? You say you're a Christian, but you're tripping them up by the way your your actions are. Are you are you putting a mountain in front of them where they can't even see God? You're like, I'm a Christian, but they're like, he says he's a Christian, but like, where is Christianity in him? If we are called Christians, that means we are Christ-like. See, when you get illuminated with the Holy Spirit, your mind. You get filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, in Calvary, we believe he's in us, he's with us, he comes upon us. The transformation process, he illuminates our mind and he transforms our thoughts and the process. He says all the old things will pass away and all things will become brand new. That's what happens. So if you're here and you're a Christian and you're the same person you were when you gave your life to God, and there's been no transformation in your actions. Well, well, I don't know. The Bible I read, that doesn't add up, right? You know, I don't, I don't. I don't know. I'm not saying you're not a Christian. I know just believing in God you are a Christian, but, you know, that's kind of sketchy if you're trying to get into heaven and you're like, there's no transformation. Like, I don't know. Watch out. All right. Flip a Yui. All right. Uh, so it says this. So are we making the straight path crooked or the crooked path straight? John's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair. And for food, he ate locust. Oh, hold on. I messed that up. John's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist, and for food, he ate locusts, for honey, locusts and honey. So when I think about this guy, I just look at him, and I know the conditions of the desert, dusty, windy, you know, the, Jew, the Jews, the, a lot of the Jews have really curly hair, you know, wind, dirt, dust. You might have just had, like, dreadlocks. Um, Samson had seven locks, and he was a Nazarite. He was a bad boy, though. He used to chase girls. Hook up with girls and get drunk, right? Bad boy, Nazarite. John the Baptist was quite the opposite. He was out there in the desert, and he reminds me of, like, the Geico commercial, Caveman. You know, when you, that's what I think about. If you live in the desert, he didn't have anything. He didn't say he had a tent or anything. He says he has camel hair, a belt. I guess he was a little bit stylish. And he ate locusts and honey. That diet is horrible. You know, but when I think about this guy... He was just a simple guy. He wasn't caught up in the hype. He wasn't, he was just a simple guy, outdoorsman, you know, wasn't, wasn't really caught up in, in much, just kind of lived his life waiting on God. But when I read this text, I think about people, they go, man, I want to be by, used by God, but I don't have anything, man. I don't got nothing. I don't have no opportunity. I don't, I don't have nothing. You got more than John the Baptist. He had locusts and honey. You're eating water burgers or whatever it's called. You got Texas Roadhouse. What else? You got In-N-Out Burger. In-N-Out Burger. You got it all. And you got some nice shoes, clothes. I see you. You got more than John the Baptist. You know what John the Baptist had? He had the feeling of the spirit. 
He had the power operating in his life. He's a man of the word. He was a man of prayer. He was a man of fasting. He was connected to the power from heaven. And that's why God used this ordinary man to do extraordinary things. He had nothing, but he had the power. He was connected. He had the juice and the Holy Ghost would manifest in him, come upon him, and work through him. And people were getting convicted. They were doing flipping U-turns, and they were getting saved. That's what he has. And guess what? You have access to the power. You have access to the word. You have access to fast. You have access to pray. But all you have to do is you have to go in that direction. It's all there waiting for you. People from Jerusalem and from all over the Jude. Is there a little bit more light in here? I'm old. <laughs> My eyes aren't as good. All right, here we go. Here we go. People from Jerusalem and from all over the Judea and all over the Jordan Valley went out to see him and hear him. John. There we go. Sorry, I'm getting old. All right. That, oh, yes. Take me to the light. All right. Thank you. See? I'm 46. I cannot believe it. What happened? All right. My wife's younger than me, and she's like, she thought marrying me. She's like, I'm going to marry an older, you know, mature guy. She's eight years younger. Sorry. Fooled her. Yes. All right, here we go. All right, here we go. So people from Jerusalem and from all over the Judea and all over the Jordan Valley went out to see him and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. So now, so let's just paint this picture. If you read my book, I'm a visual guy. I tell these different, like the way I look at things. If I was there with my friends, and, you know, if I'm sitting with Jesus at the table with Lazarus or I kind of tell these little paraphrases of like what it would be like with me and my crew. So it's kind of funny situation. So this situation, um, so people are like, okay, wait, the, the, the caveman, there's a caveman in the desert and he looks crazy and he's saying what and doing what? And he's like baptizing people in the water. Like what is going on out there? We got to go see him, who, what he looks like. And we need to hear what he's saying. So they went to go see him. And they're like, okay, this guy, hear him. And then it says they confess their sins. And then he baptized them. So his message was repentance. So if he was here today, what would he say? It would be this simple. Hey, if you're watching porn, stop watching porn. Turn to God. He loves you to death, to death of the cross. Hey, are you cheating on your wife? Hey, are you having an emotional relationship? Are you cheating at work? Are you doing little bad business deals? You're not being fair. Stop doing that. And turn to God. He loves you. Flip a Yui. Repent. That's all it was. He, God loves you to death if you're here today. He forgives you. He died on the cross. It says that he's sitting, he's interceding at the right hand of the Father. And he's waiting and he's going to forgive you with the blood that was shed on the cross. He'll wash you white as snow. He'll get your sins and cast them from the far as the east is to the west and put them in the very deepest part of the ocean and you'll never bring them up again. Maybe you're at home and you're getting that movie playing through your mind every night. All the things you should have, wish it would have done. Why did I do this? How can I do this? I can never forgive myself. Who does that? Satan. His name is the condemner. He's the one that likes to pray that play up that rail in your mind. If Jesus throws your sins as far as the east to the west and buries them in the deepest part of the ocean and never brings them up again, why the heck are you bringing that up again? You need to get unplugged from the mo from the li fi and get connected to the most high fi so you can get the downloads and the illumination of the Holy Spirit and let them transform your mind and show you who you are through the word of God. And maybe you're like, I've never heard God's voice. Read the Bible out loud. And now you heard God's voice. Yeah. You good? Yeah. All right. Here we go. So they got baptized. There was a spiritual revival happening, a great awakening in Israel. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to watch him baptize, he denounced them. You brood of snakes, he exclaimed, who warned you to flee God's coming wrath? Now, these are fighting words where I come from. Okay, caveman in the desert. The religious leaders, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the ones that God put in place, the farmers it talks about. Like, these are the pastors, if you will, to take care of God's people, right? So, 
And then the, and then the Sadducees, they're like the naturalists. They didn't believe in the resurrection or angels or anything like that. Paul went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them a couple times. But basically, they come out because they want to see and hear. And they're, you know, they, they always wanted praise. They, they thought they were the big shots, right, the big Hollywood boys, you know. We didn't, no one asked us if they could talk about God. We didn't get the memo. We didn't get the email. What's going on out there? So, you know, they all roll out with their white outfits, you know, Louis Vuitton, their, their Prada, <laughs> rolling out so fresh and so clean out in the desert to go see the caveman. They come up. They, they just come up on the scene, and John the Baptist is like, you know, be baptized, you know. And he's like, hey, hold up, hold up. You brood of snakes. Who, who warned you to flee God's coming wrath? They're probably like, what? Who is this guy talking to us? Who is this peasant guy? Look at this guy and his busted up crew. What is going on here? Like, think about this. This is a big deal. He's, 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 he's shouting out to them. Then he says, oh, before I go on, Jesus also had some kind words to say about him. Um, hypocrites. And it says that he was, Jesus was like, you know, his voice was a little high when you read it in the Bible. He was like, hypocrites, fools, blind guides, whitewashed tombs. Okay, when you go to Israel and you'll be driving down the street, you'll see this picture perfect, like, round rock in front of this wall. It, and I go, what is that? They said it's a tomb. And it's bleached white. It looks so nice. But it's a tomb. What's inside? Dead bones. Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. And he's like, you guys look nice and white on the outside, so clean. But you're dead and corrupt and full of maggots in the middle. You're just, you're just disgusting. So Jesus calls them out. John the Baptist calls them out. Then John's not done with them, so he, he drops it on them like this. He says, prove it by the way you live that you've repented of your sins and turned to God. What is he calling them? Posers. He's like, you posers. You guys are a bunch of fakes and frauds. Big Posers. I have a chapter, the last chapter of my book is called No Posers. Read more about that there. Oh, and by the way, Jesus is getting, you know, when he, when he got in those guys' face, he got punk rock. And I also have a chapter in my book called Punk Rock Jesus. And when I say punk rock, I'm not saying he has a mohawk. I'm talking about the mindset. He went against the religious system. He drove them crazy. They're the ones that crucified him. He drove them out of their minds, Right? He went against the whole religious system. You got these ordinary men, this motley crew of disciples, and he went against the whole religious system because you can't put new wine into old wineskin or else it'll burst. Jesus had to go around the whole religious system that was in place because it was broken and get some filthy fishermen. That's what I call the disciples. Filthy fishermen, stink like fish, sons of thunder, anger problems. Who has an anger problem? Can relate to that. I am more trying to work that out. You got Judas, the biggest poser in the Bible, and then you got Thomas, the sketchy guy that's always paranoid. And then Peter, he's like, says stupid stuff all the time, but he's a man of faith, right? And he like took risks and walked on water and lived the impossible. Like, who does that? Dude, it was crazy, right? But then he sank and then he got brought back up. But yeah, when you look at this motley crew of disciples, I talk about them in my book, the way I see them all. Um, God got these guys and we're still talking about them today. And they went against the whole religious system. So he says, prove it by the way you live, you posers. Don't just say to each other, we're safer, we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. For I tell you that God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. What's he saying? Basically, what he's telling you guys here today is like, if I go after you, are you a Christian? Yeah, man, I'm American. In God we trust. You haven't seen the money? Better yet, I'm from Texas. <laughs> that doesn't mean you're a Christian. You don't get into heaven off your mom and your dad's Christianity or Texas or American. And he, my, da my dad's a pastor. I'm a Christian. My dad's Raul Reese. I'm a Christian. No, it doesn't work like that. Um, what it works like is that we're Christ-like. And how? We prove it by the way we live. It's our actions. Faith in action. Here we go. So then it goes on to say this. Even now the acts of God's judgment is poised, ready to serve the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. I'm going to flip over here really quick to the next chapter and read what Jesus says. Jesus is the red text in the Bible. And Jesus says this in John chapter 7. I'm going to pick up in verse 13. I'm going to start with the narrow gate. He says, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. Okay, to get into heaven, it's narrow. The highway to hell is broad and its gates is wide for many choose to go that way. So guess what? You get to choose to go to hell. 
Jesus says, if you're not for me, you're against me. So if you're not, if Jesus Christ is not your Lord, a Lord is a title. If he's not your Lord and you run everything by him and you do according to his will, Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments. So if he's not your Lord, then you just go do you and do whatever you want to do and you'll just, you just end up in hell. <laughs> it's pretty easy. And, and hell and heaven, eternity is like buying a house. It's all about location, location, location. <laughs> Remember that. Because it's forever. Um, and hell was created for Lucifer, the demons, and all the people that denied Jesus and blasphemed the Holy Spirit. It wasn't created for you. Heaven. Well, there'll be no more tears and no more sorrows. And let me tell you about heaven. I'm from L.A. And I work, I do, I mean, I go to concerts and I go to parties. Here on planet Earth is a party, okay? We're all here at the party. And when you give your life to Christ and you repent and you flip a Yui, you get your name written in the book of life. That's the guest list. And you all know it's not about the party. It's about the after party is always the better. <laughs> that's when the hoo-hoos and that's when it's, you know, that's where the real party is. Heaven, eternity is the after party. Repenting, giving your life to Christ, the book of life is the guest list. This is just a temporary party where we're getting all who we want. Well, we want everyone to go to the after party because it's always better. So just look at it like that. So the gateway to hell is broad and many choose to go that way. But the gateway to life is, life is very narrow, he says. And the road is difficult and only few ever find it. Why is it difficult? Because if you want to be my disciple, Jesus says, or my follower, you've got to turn from your selfish ways, pick up your cross, and follow him. You have to get your body appetites, your, your fleshly appetites, and hang them to the cross and crucify them. In only the King James Version, it says, If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye live after the Spirit and mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. Mortify means to self-inflict pain when you look it up in the dictionary. You have to self-inflict pain and you have to kill the works of the flesh and let the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, dominate. The job of the Holy Ghost is to purge and destroy everything that is unholy. And if you allow the living water to flow, it will destroy and purge as you see a tsunami come into a city as it purges and destroys everything in its path. The torrents of living water will destroy everything. Just like when you see the wind blow on the trees, you don't see the wind. You see the effects of the Holy Spirit, the torrents of living water blowing and removing and purging and refining you. And then Jesus goes on to say in verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come disguised harmless as sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. That is by the way they act. Their actions prove it by the way you live. You can't pick... Um, can you pick a grape from a thorn bush or a fig from a thistle? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So, even, so every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Now Jesus gets really hardcore. He gets gangster at this point. Verse 21, he says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will get into the kingdom of heaven. Remember, Lord is a title. So they're like, yeah, God's my Lord. Oh, I love God. They talk Christianese. Oh, I got my socks blessed off at church. And, you know, he's good, but their, e their actions are evil, right? They're posers. So not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of the Father will enter. On Judgment Day, now this is when everyone's getting sorted, right, for the after parties, you know. You got the after party up here and you got the after party down there. On Judgment Day, many will say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me. You break God's law. You workers of iniquity in the King James Version, it says. So these guys at one point gave their life to Christ. They repented of their sins. There was a transformation process starting to happen. But what happened is they, just like a tree will go bad, right? Trees start off good, then they go bad. These guys got connected in strongholds. They got connected in footholds. They got entangled in the shiny objects. And they basically got deceived and they veered off. And they basically are no longer connected to the power. They are connected to the Li-Fi. And that's pretty much it to, to Satan. Now, these guys, you cannot perform miracles. You can't cast out demons. You can't give prophetic words. You can't give words of knowledge. You can't heal the sick unless you have the Holy Spirit in you because those are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So these were spirit-filled people at one point, but not anymore. 
So that question is once saved, always saved. Uh, you know, as long as you abide in the vine and you are connected to God the Father, he is a holy God. How can we be like, oh, I'm a God, I'm a Christian and this and that, but you're enwrapped in sin. Second Timothy, this is, this is just out of nowhere, but Second Timothy, it talks about vessels. There's certain kind of vessels. You have, in the king's quarters, you have the clay vessels, and then you have the gold vessels. And the scripture talks about the gold vessels are for the master to use for every special occasion, and master is Father God. But in the king's quarters, you have the clay vessels, which are made of clay. And I have a bunch of kids, so I'll say this freely. Those clay vessels are made for sewage water in the king's quarters. So what's in sewage water? Poo-poo and pee-pee. How can you say, I want to be used by God, I'm a Christian, God use me, but garbage in, garbage out, you're watching, you're listening, you're partaking, all the stuff that you're putting in your body from listening visually or even intaking, and you're a vessel of a bunch of poop and pee water, and you're like, God use me, and God's like, okay, sick, sounds like a good idea. No, God is holy. Levit Le Le Leviticus 11.45 says, For I am the Lord your God that brought you up out of the land of Egypt, that I might be your God. Therefore, you must be holy as I am holy. God rescued you from Egypt, the world. He brought you to the promised land. And he, got, he wants to take you to the land of milk and honey, the spirit-led life. But we have to repent. We have to flip a U.E. and we got to stop partaking so we could be a clean vessel, a gold vessel, illuminated and transformed by the fire and the power of the Holy Spirit. And let the, God pour the Holy Spirit and let it overfloweth. Let our cup overfloweth. And that's what God wants to do. So these people, they were, they were in the process, but the road got too difficult for them. And they got tripped up and deceived. And now they're not able to get in. To heaven on the great day of judgment. Then it says this in closing. It says, John the Baptist says, I baptize you. I baptize, oh, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is far greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to be a slave and carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And I'm going to come back to that. It's my timer, so I'm wrapping up. Um, he is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat and with the wind fork. Then he will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat in his barn and burning up the chaff with a never-ending fire. Back in those days, or even now, you'd get the wheat and you break it up. So you get rid of all the chaff so you don't need it. It falls on the ground. They get the wind fork, blow it all together, light it on fire, burn it up. It's useless. And you keep the pure stuff, the wheat. In the same way, when we give our life to Christ, we decide that we want to get baptized, water baptism. That doesn't save it's just an outward experience. And Jesus says, preach the gospel, basically let them get saved and baptize them, water baptism. And um, water baptism represents the grave. So what happens is I identify, I said, okay, Ryan Re the old Ryan Reese, I want to bury the old man because I want to live by the spirit-led life now. So I, as my dad dunked me in this freezing cold pool in December, that was, a, that was freezing, but I didn't care. So it was December and it was frozen. And he dunked me in this pool, and the water represents me leaving that old Ryan Reese in the grave and then coming out with the water coming off me, that new spirit that life, the, the living water. And it's interesting where John the Baptist was, his water was brown. It looked like dirt. So he was baptizing people, and the, the, the water represents the grave. So you think about that. You go under. You don't see that person. It's like, it looks like he's in the ground. And then you come up, and even the water's dirty. It still looks like all clean water when it, when it comes off of you. So that's so interesting when you, when you really think about that. God showed me that on this trip. Um, so then you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8, Jesus says to the disciples, remember, he blew on them, and they received the Holy Spirit in them. Okay, so they had the Holy Spirit in them, but then he says, don't start your public ministry until the Holy Spirit has come and you've had that upon experience, the feeling, the baptism, the fire of the Holy Spirit, the dunamis power. That's where we get our word dynamite power of the Holy Spirit. And what happened? They sat, they wait, the Holy Spirit came upon them. It baptized them. It filled them. They got the powerful service of the operation of the Holy Spirit, the dunamis power. And, they, and basically from that point, they went out and they just tore it up for Jesus. So that is the fire and the power of the Holy Spirit. As you get raw gold, you put it into the fire. It has information. I always say this. I always mess up this word. I have to ask the crowd every time. What are the impurities? Infirmities. So they, they basically burn that out and it turns that gold into pure 
gold. And then once God removes the stuff in your life, he will, like the potter on the wheel in Jeremiah, he's going to break you down, mold you, and turn you into that vessel. And I believe that God uses every chapter in your life, he shapes you and shifts you into a different vessel because he breaks it down, he breaks you, crushes you, and then he, he reforms you. In every different chapter in your life, you become this new vessel that God wants to use for every special work. So that is the fire and the power of the Holy Spirit with water and spirit. Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. I'm the one who needs to baptize you. He replied, so why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done, for we must carry out all of God's requirements. Remember Jesus? They said, Jesus, where are you at? His parents. He says, don't worry about me. I'm about my father's business. He's about his father's business. He says, always in submission to the father. Not my will, your will be done. So John agreed to baptize him. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were split and the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove and a voice said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost as one. The Trinity operating just like in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God, that word is Elohim. God's, that was the Trinity working together. In the beginning, God's created the heavens and the earth and nothing was created but through them. So there's the Trinity at the beginning and at the end. From there, Jesus goes out to the wilderness. To uh, He gets baptized with the Holy Spirit. He's about to start his public ministry. Jesus is the model. He gets filled. He's out there fasting ferociously, praying hard for 40 days like our boy John the Baptist. And he's waiting on God. And Mr. Shiny Object shows up, Lucifer. And he rolls up and he's like, oh, Ben, you, you fasting? I know you're hungry. Make if you've been to Israel, it's all rocks. Make some bread out of these rocks. you got to be starving. Forget this stupid spiritual stuff. And maybe Satan's telling you guys, forget fasting, forget praying, stupid spiritual stuff. Just feed your flesh. Don't worry about all this stuff. And then Jesus fires off the word of God at him. Then he takes him to the top of the mountain. He's like, hey, man, I know you're in this whole God thing and all that, and you want to be famous in the church? Jump off the temple. The Bible says, remember, Satan knows the scriptures. And all you have to do is twist one scripture and you have a cult, one word, and you have a cult in the whole Bible. He's all, jump off the, the, jump off the temple, the big mega church, and the angels will catch you. You'll be famous. You'll be a rock star up in the church. Everyone's going to know your name. You'll be a famous pre preacher boy. So then he fires off the word of God. Then he takes him to this mountaintop and goes, hey, you came for the world, right? But you got to go to the cross and die. Sounds painful. Why don't you just uh, forget all that? I, I got the deed from Adam. I got the keys of the earth. I'm the prince of the earth, of the world, actually. Kind of a big deal. Um, want me to hook you up? I'll hook you up. You just bow down. You worship me, and you'll get it all. Forget all that spiritual stuff and dying on the cross and raising them from the dead. Forget that. I'll give it all to you the easy way right in the air, right now. So Jesus fires off the word of God, and he flees. So my grandma, she was a missionary, Bana, she used to say, it's my mom's mom, she used to sing this song called the Salvation Army Song. And one, one of the lyrics says, come and join the army, get your gospel gun, shoot it at the devil if you want to see him run. So I started going, God, where is that in the Bible? Well, I just told you the story of it. So basically what happens is we're all magazines. The Bible is an ammo box. There's roughly 34 to 36,000 verses of the Bible, depending on what translation you read. As you receive, you repent, you flip a U.E., God puts the person of the Holy Spirit in. The Holy Spirit can only pull from what he has received. So the Holy Spirit is the, 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 is the power from heaven, the dunamis power, the gun power, if you will. And you read the word of God, and what you're doing is you're loading your magazine with rounds. If you read the whole Bible, you got 32 to 36,000 rounds. And then what happens is when that devil comes and starts shooting off the life fi firing the fiery dark, trying to entangle in these shiny objects, what happens is the Holy Spirit will start pulling scriptures and will start firing off of the devil. And the thing is, is... As I told you, with sin, it cuts the connection to the power of the Holy Spirit, the gunpowder. So what happens is if when the devil comes for you, you want to be clean. You don't want to be operating in sin because it cuts off the power source. So you're going to be depending on shooting 22 bullets at the devil or 50 cal round. 
So you want to keep that line open. You want to keep the power coming. You want to be a man of the word of God and power. So when the devil comes, you pull out your gospel gun, shoot it at the devil, and you will see him run every time. Because why? There's power in the name of Jesus. And the word became flesh. And we are men and women of the word of God. This last season, about a year and a half ago, I almost left my wife. I, was, I quit ministry. And I basically started getting flooded with fear, depression, anxiety. I went through a crazy, crazy time in my life. And Satan came to sift me. He came to sift me because the book was about to come out. And I went through the perfect storm of my life. We sold our house. We were living in L.A. Everything was shut down. There's all these different things happening. Me and my wife never had a problem with each other. But it was the pressures of life. I was getting hit by a demonic attack. And literally, I was done. Now I know why people want to commit suicide. They just want to turn it all off. But you know what saved me? Every day I would read the Bible. This stinking Bible app was shooting bullets at me. The verse of the day, every day. And literally, I'd be like, I would just see it every day, like, oh, my gosh. And I would hold on to that scripture like it was a matter of life and death because it was a matter of life and death. And I held on to the word, and God got me through by the skin of my teeth. And with the scripture says, he will never give you more than you can handle. I was at the breaking point. I couldn't do it. But God got me through, and I didn't walk. He carried me through. I look back at a lot of blackout times in my life because of what was going on. It's been over a year now. God has restored me. I'm still a little shaken a little bit because that was crazy. God, don't ever send me there again. But now this is the message and the story that God has given me to give to you. He prepared me because some of you are dealing with fear, anxiety, depression, brokenness, divorce, addiction, strongholds, footholds, getting flooded with fear at night because of business, whatever it is. God loves you. He has a plan. He'll get you through. He needs you to f- repent, flip a Yui, come, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Receive the fire. Receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Receive the living water, the love, the joy, the self-control, all the attributes. And receive that and live that and walk out of here a different person. If that's you, you need to come back to the Lord. You need to give your life to the Lord. Maybe you're here and you don't know what you need. You're just like, I need something. God knows and he will touch you in a personal, unique way. If that's you and you need prayer, just stick your thumb up right now. And I want to pray for you before I walk out of here. Right on. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Okay. There's a lot of you. I see you all. Awesome. This is a hospital. This is why we're here. We're all the same. I'm a dirty sinner just like you. Say by grace. But the sin is getting less and less and less as we transform into the image of Christ until we get to heaven. We're under construction. Remember, we're a sign. We're under construction. Christians, we're not perfect. I'm going to pray for you. Lord, all these people that are here, you know, you see, and we're going to hold you to your word. You said, anyone that's thirsty may come to me. Anyone that believes in me may come and drink. For the scripture declares torrents of living water will flow forth. So, Lord, I just pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you will touch their lives. And as we say this prayer of repentance, Lord, that you will meet them here. If you want to repent, I just want everyone just in this place just to say, Jesus. Everyone out loud, say, Jesus. Jesus. Please forgive me of all my sins. Fill me with the torrents of the living water. And baptize me with your Holy Ghost. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And I'm going to pray over you. Father God in heaven, in Jesus' name. Lord, I I pray that you will release and open up the reservoir to the living water. I know the Holy Spirit is here, but we ask for more. I pray that you will pour out in this place. Let them encounter the waves of the living water flow through this room now, Lord. Release peace, release joy, release release love. Lord, I pray for all spiritual strongholds, footholds, that in Jesus' name, that you will break that off of them right now. In Jesus' name, because who the Son of God sets free is free indeed. Lord, I pray that you will lift depression off people in Jesus' name. That heaviness, that cloudiness, that you will break through with clarity in Jesus' name. I pray for suicidal thoughts. People that are hearing voices or getting those promptings from the enemy, that counterfeiter, I pray that you will break that off and heal them in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you will increase faith in this room in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you will break off anxiety, depression, 
Lord, floods of fear, send fear back to hell in Jesus' name. Lord, all that supernatural stuff from the enemy that work, I pray that you will clear this place today in Jesus' name, Lord, that you will set them free. Lord, I pray for those ones that are struggling with sexual uh, sexual identity, Lord, that they were dabbling with, with homosexuality. Maybe they have started off straight and they've opened themselves to pornography because the pro progression of pornography, it has led them into homosexuality, Lord, that you will reel them in, bring them back, bring clarity, God, set them free, renew their mind. Those ones that have uh, connections to drugs, Lord, and pills, I pray that you will break that off. People that are having affairs and divorces, bring them back together. Break those affairs, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name, even for a healing touch, people's bodies, backs, necks, muscles, spines, blood disorders, disease, whatever it is, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, be healed. Lord, you said preach the gospel, signs and wonders follow, Lord. So we are holding you to your word again. Lord, I pray that you will do that. And if there's people that are not getting healed because it's a supernatural demonic thing like we read about in the Bibles that inflict pain and blindness in ears, we read in the Bible, anything that's not of you, Jesus Christ, in the flesh, go now and then be healed in Jesus' name. In the mighty name of Jesus, you are the great physician. You are the healer, Lord. Just make that pain go. Those headaches go, that blood, make it right, and let them go to the doctors and figure it out, Lord. Like they will get a clean check, just like you healed that chick's leg the other day, Lord, that we prayed for that um, um, ACL, Lord. Just like you did that at that Calvary Chapel, she was playing uh, basketball the next week, and we saw her, Lord. You do it. This is nothing for you, Lord. So we thank you for your mighty power in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Lord. One more time, Lord. Just give them more of that peace, more of that joy, more of that feeling of the Holy Spirit, Lord. And as we go into this song, Waymaker, Lord, this was the lyrics I was holding on to like it was a matter of dear in life because the lyrics say, we don't always see you working, but we know you're working, Lord. And as I walk off this stage, Lord, and as they play, I pray in Jesus' name that the Holy Spirit will continue to fill this room and work on people's hearts, Lord, and let these lyrics just go into their souls and their minds and just speak to them during this time, Lord. In Jesus' name. From creation to the cross There from the cross into eternity Your grace finds Yes, your grace. 